Welcome to ModLeak. My name is Jeffrey Stern, and at ModLeak, we light a spark or shed some light on a Jewish text or tradition. Along with Rabbi Adam Mintz, we host ModLeak Disruptive Toe on Clubhouse and share it as the ModLeak podcast on your favorite platform. This week's Torah portion is Emor. In it, we come across the source for the tradition for Jewish men to grow beards and peyot, those side curls, and the prohibition to cut the corners of the beard. We are struck by a recurring theme of the holiness of the corner, whether it's grooming the beard, agricultural laws, or in the four-cornered garment. And we wonder whether there is anything more at play here. So join us for Rounding the Corner. Well, welcome, Rabbi. Another exciting week of Madlik Disruptive Torah. I'm looking forward. And of course, this week talking about getting a haircut is perfect because the holiday of getting a haircut, Lag Baomer, is next Tuesday. So I thought you chose a great topic for this week. You know, I was thinking I, there were two things that happened in the search preparing for this. One was every time I tried to do a search about Jewish customs of grooming the hair, grooming the beard, it is such a popular topic today that it was very hard to get anything Jewish. Men are just much more uh, interested. Uh, growing beards uh, is is uh, in fashion again. Um, so that is interesting. And as you say, um, here we are. Part of the Jewish calendar is revolves around grooming a beard. Part of the mourning p- process revolves around grooming the beard. So whether we uh, make make fun of it or not, it is a, a part of uh, of of the Jewish traditions. And um, the other thing that was very difficult was um, there was a lot of focus on shaving, not shaving, and stuff like this. But you will see, as I said in the introduction, this focus on the square and rounding the square, what I called rounding the corner. Uh, I didn't find many people who were struck as much as I were, uh, and I mentioned just a few. I didn't mention I mentioned tefillin. I mentioned the arba kanfot, the four-cornered garment. I obviously mentioned the subject matter, which is grooming the corners of the beard. And I mentioned agricultural laws, the corners of the field, which you will be talking about probably on Shavuot, because Ruth um, was one of the poor women who had was gleaning the corners of Boaz's field. But I was surprised that there was not that many, if any, people that were trying to to connect those um, those points. Um, are you struck by this? I wouldn't say it's a fixation, but certainly a recurring theme of the square and the rounding of that square. There's no question. Corners are important. Borders, I see, I, I look at it, I broaden it a little bit. Borders, limits are important. Svirata Omer is a limit, right? You count 49 days. The Torah is very familiar with um with with setting limits, with saying, you know, you can you can you can cut your hair or you can cut your hair only this amount. That's something that's very prevalent in the Torah. In truth, it's prevalent in every legal system, the idea of setting limits. I agree, but we're going to focus on rounding the corner. So uh, mm-hmm. let's go. Leviticus 21.5 in our Parshat and more, it says, They shall not shave smooth any part of their heads or cut the side growth of their beards or make gashes in their flesh. And we're talking about rules for a priest, for a Kohen, uh, against what they can do during mourning. Uh, In the Hebrew, when it talks about side growth of their beards, it's talking about upa'at zekenam, the um, other translations like the Koran actually translate that as the corner of their beard. Um, 
This is not the first time we've been exposed to this. In Leviticus 19.27, it says, You shall not round off the side growth on your head or destroy the side growth of your beard. And here uh, it does say, The corner of your beard. But it says, You shall not round off. For those of you who have ever been to a synagogue on Sukkot on Simchat Torah and have engaged in Hakafot. Hakafot is when you take the Torah in the center and you go around it. You circle around it um, almost in a, a snake, I think they call it, or maybe is it a train that they do uh, at Bar Mitzvahs, but it's Hakafot is to circle around. So here it literally says, you shall not circle the corners of your beard. And in Rashi on that Leviticus 27, he said, really, hakef rosho a gold saviv, that you should not um, circumvent your, 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 your head um, and make a goal, is the Hebrew word for a corner, um, and making a, uh, a goal around it into uh, a, a circumvention. So we have these two things. We have the pe'a, which uh, you say is a border and a boundary. We will get to that. But certainly the traditional interpretation of pe'a, especially in this regard is more of a corner, not necessarily the corner of a square. Rashi in Leviticus uh, 19.27 talks about, quoting the Talmud, that there are actually five corners of the beard. Um, We're talking about the two cheekbones um, and the chin and um, the the height of the temples. Um, So the idea is um, that you cannot... uh, get rid of those angles. Uh, the next Rashi gives a start of a reason why. Um, it says, because non-Jewish nations do so, so that you shall be separated from them. So it seems, and this is the traditional explanation, uh, I, I, I'd love you to confirm this, that for mourning rites, the tradition seems to be that non-Jews would do a bunch of things. They would gash themselves, they'd mutilate themselves, they might tear out their hair. Um, and um, you, if you want to f- make be very minimalistic and focused, you would say we shouldn't mourn that way. And the key here is to be separated from them. I should say that uh, we focused on what you can't do. But clearly, the flip side of this is that it has become a tradition for Jews to grow a beard and, more precisely, to grow sidelocks or those peyot, mostly amongst uh, Eastern European Hasidic Jews, but also Yemenite Jews. And while Eastern European Hasidic Jews call it peyot, the Yemenite Jews call it simanim, which means literally, in a- accordance with this Rashi, something that is a siman is a sign that distinguishes us from them. I know that's amazing. That's so great that you bring that up because the you know the the Yemenites obviously take that word from Rashi and it it says so much more. Peyot just describe what they are, right? They're side birds. But Simanim talks about the fact that we're distinguished um, with the side birds, and I think that's an interesting thing to talk about about what everybody else used to do and why what we do is different. Absolutely. So you could simply say that there is no deeper meaning here. It's just they do one thing, we do the opposite. And by the way, it is kind of ironic, is it not? that today, uh, when my father passed away, 
I grew a beard. Um, so so uh, here they were, um, there were some who, who really look at this uh, from an aesthetic point of view, from a fashion point of view. And since in those days the fashion was to have a beard, if you were mourning, you would rip out that beard. Um, nowadays that we shave, if I want to show that I'm in mourning, I grow You a grow beard. the beard. Right. Yeah. But it, so, so on the one hand, at a very basic level, it shows you that at least uh, the facial hair wars or the facial hair statement is, is still alive and well. Um, it's a way of showing your disposition. Uh, the Maimonides in the Mishnah Torah goes a step further than saying simply that it distinguishes our practice from their practice. He says, we may not shave the corners of our heads as the idea idolaters and their priests do. So this brings in two more elements. Number one, and we came across this a little bit last week, where we were talking about rules that related to women who did certain things, could they marry a Kohen? And we really extrapolated that broadly. Here too, these rules are really uh, stated with regard to a Kohen, but no one is is saying that uh, these morning rituals, if a Kohen can't do it, we extrapolate to say none of us can do it. So that's the first interesting thing. But the other, that is interesting. The other interesting thing is that he's saying it's idolaters and it's their priests. So now it's not simply doing what the non-Jews do, but what the non-Jews do, one would assume, as a cultic, as a religious, idolatrous practice. And that, of course, has synergy with why our kohanim, our priests, can't do it, but also why we generally can't do it. Right. I mean, now we're now we're getting into a whole a little bit of a different area. And that is what what do the priests have to do with this issue? Why should it be that the priests can do it? You know, priests are holy somehow. Why does why does cutting your hair and being holy and being a priest? What do those all have to do with one another? That's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting, and I am now going to ask you a trivia question that that just popped into my head. The Yiddish word, maybe the Hebrew word for a priest, is a galach, is it not? Yeah, that's a non-Jewish priest, is a galach. A galach. Now, does galach have anything to do with the hit galach? To, to. I'm sure not, but that's a good question. <laughs> you know, you can always say a Dvar Torah about anything. So you can say that Dvar Torah. <laughs> Except all of the Russian Orthodox priests that I've ever seen and the uh, uh, Greek Orthodox have nice beards. So that yeah, really doesn't, it doesn't hold Where does up. that come from? Okay, right? so that was the trivia question. Let's move on. So um, the Mishnah Torah continues and it adds, this is my mind adds another element here. And in uh, Mishnah Torah, uh, Foreign Worship and Customs 12.3, it says, all the Torah's prohibitions apply equally to men and women, with the exception of the prohibition against shaving, uh, cutting off the corners of one heads, and uh, something to do with priests. And I need to say that this is before he says the more obvious uh, uh, thing, which is what everybody seems to know, which is that that women do not have to are not required to do uh, commandments that are, are uh, dependent on time. But this is one that I had never seen. You could say it's kind of obvious, isn't it, that a woman um, would not be under the influence of shaving a beard because she doesn't have a beard. Right, um, of course. The right. question is, and I think Maimonides gets into this: who is this? Uh, who who is the sin on? Is it the one who gets shaved or the shaver but it right is. and they say both and that's also fascinating and therefore maybe if you go to a non-jewish barber you could actually have you know that's different because you know if, if the question is who the who the prohibition is on well absolutely but what is fascinating to me is here it brings in another element and what it brings in is that any rules regarding the beard, at the end of the day, it's pretty clear that they relate to manhood. 
they extrapolate slightly uh, more generally and it create it's it relates to masculinity or um, a man's uh, identity um, one of the um, fascinating um, commentaries that I could not find in Sfira but is brought in an amazing article in one of my favorite go-to points I've mentioned it many times before the Torah.com is a rabbi Tzazev Farber quotes Bachir ben Asher, who says that the reason you cannot shave or you cannot uh, round the corners of your beard is because the beard is a main way of differentiating between men and women. And he puts this in the same category as the prohibitions that we find in Deuteronomy 22.5 about a man can't dress like a woman and vice versa. So he's really focused on the gender identity element of this rule. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, wow, that's a good thing to find. Right. So so very much this is gendered, which I mean, which which might just be practical that women don't grow beards. You see, usually when you talk about things being gendered, it's kind of a criticism. Why does it only apply to men and not to women? But in this case, it's, it doesn't sound like it's really a problem. Right. That's just the way it is that it applies to men and not women. So the word that we would use in this particular instance is emasculating. The idea that, yes, we are gender neutral in in the modern era, but nonetheless, uh, women and men are different. They're physiologically different. Uh, Whatever you want to say, or at least, uh, you know, those of us who don't want to go all the way will say, there is a word called emasculating, uh, and maybe it's a man's problem that he feels emasculated uh, if he does certain things, and he should get over it. But I think the 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 um, the, uh, the 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 source that we just quoted of Bachir ben Asher, and maybe even Maimonides, see in this uh, trimming of the beard and and the rules relating to the beard, rules that relate to the manhood of a man, so to speak. And um, towards the distinction between men and women, uh, and you started by talking about the boundaries, uh, if there are boundaries uh, in, in, in the Torah, uh, this is uh, an area where uh, you, get that, uh, you get that seminal, that message. That's my read on it. That's a good read on it. I think that's 100% right. I think that is the read here. So I said in the introduction that there are other instances of corners. Um, One of the great commentaries on Leviticus, and I've mentioned before, you actually do need commentaries on Leviticus because much of it is very difficult for us who don't have a temple, who don't have all these rules of uh, purity. Um, So uh, Baruch A. Levine uh, writes, You shall not round off the side growth on your head, Hebrew pay is the same word used in verse 9 in Leviticus 19.9 to designate the corner or edge of a field. Hebrew lo takifu, you shall not round, derives from the word nakaf to encircle. Certain peoples who inhabited the desert areas are referred to as ke Tutse Pea, men with their side growth cut off. So, in this simple little paragraph, I was launched on, um, um, well, at least I found a anchor for what I was fascinated with, which is how does this word Pea find itself, this concept of corner, and um, find itself elsewhere? And, and what I'd like to uh, suggest before we start looking at all of the sources. Sources, is that one way or another, um, whether it's in the verse that we're going to read now about the need to leave the corners of the field for the poor and the stranger, the biblical editor establishes as an obvious thematic link between corners of the beard and corners of the field and 
corners seem to be holy or consecrated, which means that they need to either be dedicated to God or to chosen on earth. That seems, at least to me, to be the connection between all the corners that we're going to look at. And before I open it up to discussion, let me read Leviticus 9.9. When you reap the harvest, and remember, it's 19.9. It's in the same chapter as the first occurrence of this prohibition of the Kohanim of rounding the corners of their beard. So it's not far-fetched to say that the biblical author was aware that they were using the same word for different use cases. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap all the way to the edges of your field, not all the way to the pa'at pe'at sodecha, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. If you're picking up a bale of hay and you drop some hay, you need to leave those gleanings for the poor, like Ruth." You shall not pick your vineyard bare or gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am God, your God. Um, so now already, uh, I think I have uh, a little bit of a basis to say, yes, it's mandated by God, but there's an issue of, uh, of holiness here, of leaving those. The translation we have is edges, which is much in line with how you started, Rabbi, talking about boundaries uh, or corners of the field. But do you, do you think like me that there is a connection here that we can't uh, ignore, that it's not really... Drash. There has to be a connection. The fact that it's written together has to be there's a connection. Yeah, so what does Levine say? Levine is great. You should just say Levine was a professor of Bible at NYU for many, many decades. He was a real scholar. Fantastic. Well, if you recall, he not only made the connection to uh, the uh, the verse about the field, but he made a reference to Jeremiah. And I, frankly, had never looked at these verses in Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah nine, it, it's talking about uh, Jeremiah really, you know, warning the children of Israel of what's happening and how bad they are. And low days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will take note of everyone serving circumcised in the foreskin, of Egypt, Judah, Edom, the Amorites, Moab, and all the desert dwellers who have the hair of their temples clipped. For all these nations are uncircumcised, but all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. What's fascinating to me is that Jeremiah mixes metaphors of circumcision with this people uh, in the desert who are called the Kitsotse Pe'ah. They have, um, uh, they have uh, clipped the, uh, the corners of their beard. Uh, it happens three other times. Interesting, what Rashi says on this verse is Pe'ah, in this regard, an expression of an end, those cast off to the corner of the desert. So Rashi she doesn't even believe that these people are literally ones who clip the corners of their beard. What they are is they are marginalized. They are at the outside of the desert. And if you take that and the fact that when he talks about circumcision, he's clearly also talking, talking metaphorically because he even actually says that when I say that the Jews are uncircumcised, I mean that they are orally Lave. They are uncircumcised of heart. So what's fascinating to me is we've established in a sense that um, part of this um, uh, dialogue has to do with manhood. Here we have uh, a situation where you are um, on the outside, you are on the borders or over the side of the borders, and whether it's uh, literal or figurative, he's talking about, I had never thought of circumcision, 
in terms of rounding the corner, so to speak. But here we have all of these these metaphors again uh, that, to me, are, uh, are stimulating and and kind of fascinating. And started me. Maybe it was because last week we, we were talking about <laughs> such sexually graphic things. But but the <laughs> point is that um, there that he puts it in the same context. And it has to do with removing or making holy this outer outer boundary. Fascinating to me. That is interesting. So the, the boundary becomes a sign of holiness. It's not that the boundary is holy, but the boundary becomes a sign of holiness. Now, why is that? So I think that holiness, the what holiness is, is it separates the holy from the non-holy. It's about boundaries, because the minute that something, you go too far, it's not holy anymore. It, it's mundane. It's regular. So holiness is about establishing boundaries. This is going to be, I'll give you an example. You walk into shul. People, uh, you know, people act differently in shul than they do outside of shul. And therefore, you could be having a certain conversation when you're walking to shul, and then you walk into the building, and you stop having that conversation. And you might say to the person you're having the conversation with, this isn't appropriate for shul. That's a boundary of holiness. I think also, and I agree with what you just said, but I think also there's always a very close line between holy and profane between what is holy and what is perush and not holy. And I think we can't kind of um, uh, understand this in total because clearly, for instance, in circumcision, the uh, orla is rejected. Uh, it's the corner, if you will, that's that's thrown away. But but there is this, this concept of, um, uh, and clearly the people that he's referring to in the death desert are outcasts. Um, but again, it just sensitized me. Um, and I don't think we're going to have answers and I don't think we're going to be able to connect all the dots. But I do think that I, I want to establish it's a rich area of, of, of research that I don't think has been done. Let's move on to the tzitzit, the Araba Kanfot. In Deuteronomy 22.12, it says, you shall make tassels on the four corners of the garment which cover you. So here it doesn't use Abba Pinot. It doesn't use Abba Peot. It says Abba Knafot. Um, uh, it uses a different word, uh, but I feel we have a license to relate it again because it's clear that it is those four corners. And I think what we're dealing with is less something that is literary and something that is uh, based on imagery, based on really a core kind of uh, conceptual uh, 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 notion of what these corners are and what the rounding is. Uh, it uses, uh, uh, in Deuteronomy 23.1, it says, no householder um, shall take his father's former wife as his own wife, so as to remove his father's garment. Kanaf Aviv. So here again, it's that outer perimeter that is female, but it belongs to the man. Uh, I, I'm making a little bit of a stretch here, but I mean, that's how I kind of, uh, I'm starting to read this. And and before I discuss it, let's go to the real kanafim, the kanafayim. If you think in terms of, and we have studied this before, their churubim, uh, that have their wings spread out, it uses the same word as it uses for the four corners of the garment. It used perusha kanafayim. They spread their wings um, over the uh, um, the uh, uh, Aron, the, uh, and they have them facing each other. Um, so really, uh, getting back to what you were discussing before about corners or sides, in the temple, it many times refer refers to the sides of the temple. Um, the west side is Lapatiam, the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, the other side is mipat panav, uh, well, mipat yam, mipat kadma. So we're talking about a very symmetrical square temple, whether it's the Mishkan or the temple, the Migdash itself. And um, we are having these knafim on top of this square arc. And they're facing each other. And we also have in, in the use of pa'at panav, the, the face. It just made me think of the chiruvim totally different. As this, again, this dialectic between this square um, uh, um, arc and this square temple, and the knafim uh, the, on the Arba Kanfot, uh, somehow neutralizing it, somehow embellishing it, somehow um, making it more female and male. Uh, these, I, I think, are, I couldn't find anyone else who was really looking in this direction. Um, but I do think it's a very, you know, when we talk about the iconography of Judaism, of ancient Judaism, uh, even the tefillin, uh, which are these strange boxes that are, we put on. Um, the, the Talmud in the Yerushalmi Talmud says, the, uh, well, the regular Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud says, it's a halacha lemosha mesinai, that they have to be square. The Jerusalem Talmud, it's in our notes, says that square is something that doesn't ever appear in nature. Nature. One of the midrashim that I saw is that the tefillin are called batim. They're called houses. Um, and um, uh, one of the, we, we dwelt upon this before, v'shechanti betocham, I will uh, have my presence within you. Why does it say betocham and lo betocho? And this commentary says, betocho, right? Because the mem at the end of Petocham is muruba, is square. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is. Oh, that's great! This Who says that? So I found it in a, a Chabad uh, uh, commentary uh, that quoted it from somewhere that I couldn't find, but it definitely said the mem in Petocham is in the square temple and in the batim of the tefillin. And of course, what we do with the tefillin? I have a picture here. I had to go to images of uh, someone who compares. It's not actually. Actually, the tefillin, it's the case of the tefillin with the hakafot lahavdil that uh, the Muslims do around the Kaaba, their square uh, edifice. Um, and uh, in his commentary, he says, and if you consider wrapping the ritsua of the tefillin around your arm, you are in a sense making that hakafa. You are rounding the square. Um, in, I have a picture of from the Cairo Geniza of tefillin that were found that had the base square in accordance with the Halacha Lemosha Messinai, but the middle part uh, is conical. Um, is it a, a phallic image? I, You know, again, you have to look at the images, and we need someone to take this further, but I was in a place called Angor Wat in Cambodia, and I couldn't get out of my mind that all of the temples were based on this kind of lotus um, a motif where the middle part was coming straight up and on the four corners was either a square that later became a uh, part of this lotus motif around it, the birth of the thing. But again, there was this sense of the middle was a male and the around it was um, female. I, I, at the, we're coming to the end of our time. But I think what you're pointing out is something that's really interesting. We don't usually do this, but what you're really pointing out is that it's all about images, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, you look at the images, I have pictures of uh, circling around a chuppah, and uh, there too, it's based on maybe on Jeremiah that says, Nekeva to Sofev Gever. 
that a woman goes around, rounds the man. Um, I have pictures of that square chuppah, which is also that based on that Arba Kanfot, um, of uh, a Hasidim dancing around it. It, it, it. To me, what I thought of, and I'm going to end here because we are running out of time, is a movie with Richard Dreyfuss in it called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I know I that movie. I don't think we're talking about influences. I don't think that anything happened in Cambodia and Buddhism uh, w- uh, was directly uh, uh, affected or uh, came from the same source as what we have. But I do think that maybe there's something here. Here, Clearly a phallic image is something that is kind of universal. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's something that kind of unites us with the iconography of the world in helping us to understand some of the iconography that we have in the Torah. But clearly, I, I, I challenge anyone who disagrees with any of the conclusions or the, the, maybe the, the ideas that I'm throwing out to deny that there isn't something with this uh, 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 squaring the circle, circling the square, turning the corner. There's a, uh, there's a, th- a thread there. There's a trend there which I find fascinating. I think that's great. This was a great this was a great topic today. I think there are so many things to think about. The images, the squares, the circles, and it really gives us something to wonder about as we enjoy this wonderful parsha. So happy so good job, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Happy Lagba Omer, and we look forward to seeing everybody next Thursday night. Shabbat shalom. We'll see you all next week.